everyone! I'm Rebecca and welcome back to my channel. This video is a long overdue video on how I made my 1830s Governor Ratcliffe costume. Now, there are kind of two reasons why this video is so long overdue, considering I made this project back in April and it is now August. One of them is just that I've had a lot of videos planned and it kind of just fell to the wayside. But the other one, and really the bigger obstacle here, is that I did an absolutely atrocious job of documenting my work on this project. And because of that, I don't remember a lot of the things that I did. And so it's made me very hesitant and reluctant to even share this video at all. However, I have been promising this video for months. So I figure even if there's a few things that I can't remember, it's probably still worth showing you how I made this 1830s dress. Now this dress was made for a group costume that was supposed to happen at Costume College this year. Yeah. That said, it's still on the schedule for next year, and that group is 1830s Disney Villains. When we first came up with this group at Costume College 2019, I kind of went through both what villain would look good translated into the 1830s and what would kind of make sense there, as well as keeping in mind what fabrics I had in my stash. I happened to already have, I believe, seven yards of this magenta silk shantung. And so who better as a magenta character to do that also translates well to the 1830s than Governor Ratcliffe, who is from the 1600s. The 1830s borrowed heavily on designs from the 1600s, and so really translating the 1600s to the 1830s is actually very easy because that was when that style kind of came back into vogue. I began this project by drawing out a sketch. This was the design that I decided on for my 1830s Governor Ratcliffe, borrowing the collar of his outfit, the color, and also things like the turquoise sash and the black belt of his outfit, and translating them into the 1830s. Now, I have done several 1830s outfits before. I've done an evening dress, I've done an archery dress, I've done a day wear, and I've actually done an 1830s bathing costume slash active wear, really funky costume, which I did for a bathing suit group costume several years ago for Costume College. So I have done the 1830s before, and so the first thing that I did with this was I dug through my stash of patterns slash mock-ups because I don't always create patterns from things that I've made. Sometimes I just save my mock-ups. And so I dug through that stash and found the 1830s pattern that I've used in the past. The last time that I used it was January of 2017, I believe. I used that pattern to create this bodice. Now, I hate to say it, I don't remember where that pattern originated from because the first time that I used it was, I think, back in 2014, and I just don't know where it started. But it probably started with a Simplicity or Butter pattern that I highly altered into the pattern that I used for the 1830s and also have used for the 1860s. <laughs> As we go through this video and the making of, I will pop some pictures up on the screen here of some of my in-progress shots, but I started with the skirts of this dress. Now, the skirts of this dress are made of three panels of the entire width of the silk shantung, so I believe that was approximately a 55-inch width, and all of them are flat-lined with cotton organdy. I really like flatlining my 1830s skirts with cotton organdy. I find that it really helps to give them the body that you want. All of these skirt panels are completely straight because in the 1830s they were just straight panels and then they were pleated or cartridge pleated or gathered, etc. into the waist. So all of these are just completely straight panels, which is one of the nice things about the 1830s. It's pretty easy and it doesn't have a lot of fabric waste. 
This has an approximately one and three quarters, I think, inch hem, though it is turned over inside, so it's actually a little bit deeper than that. The hem also, if you have a little bit extra, helps to give it some body. One of the other nice things about the 1830s is that you don't have to worry about tripping over your hems because 1830s hems are all off the ground at least a few inches, and so you don't have to worry about those hems getting dirty, getting torn, etc., by dragging on the ground like you do in so many other eras. Once I finished the skirt, I moved on to the bodice. Now, the bodice, when you take away this sort of pleated bertha area, looks like a pretty standard bodice with the single dart on each side, and this front is not straight. I find that I tend to, tend to have a very hard time with a straight fronted bodice, so this is a significantly curved bodice seam in the center front, and it's covered over here by a black velvet ribbon. The back of the bodice consists of a side back piece and a back piece does not quite fit Antoinette here so it looks a little wonky but uh with piping in the seam the 1830s loved piping so you see piping in a lot of seams and I tried to put it pretty much everywhere that was pretty standard for piping in this outfit the skirts are attached to the bodice in the front they have nice deep knife pleats I don't measure my pleats I eyeball my pleats. So these pleats are probably different widths, but I would say in general they're about an inch and a half-ish, and they take up with a lot of the bulk of the skirts. I wanted to make sure that my pockets were at a reasonable place. My pockets are in the side seam. I have one right here. So I wanted them to be fairly close to the side of the bodice. So basically we have one full panel of the skirt from here to about here. Where's that other pocket? I can't feel it, but somewhere in there. And then we have two panels that are in the back. Now the back of the skirt, the knife pleats go to approximately even with the side back seam. And then the very backs are actually cartridge pleated into the bodice, giving that really nice full look. As I mentioned, most of the seams of the bodice are piped. The center front is not, and the side front is not but every other seam on the bodice is piped so that is the waistline is piped the side back is piped the arm eyes are piped and the neckline is piped so you have to make sure that you do that piping before you attach your skirts to the bodice now i didn't want to cut into my skirts even though we have a pointed front in the bodice so the skirt actually goes up to about here i'll show you an interior bit in here uh, but the skirt actually goes up to about here and this is just sewn down on top of the skirt so that I didn't have to cut any of that excess off. The top of the skirt is whipped down into the bodice so that it won't get in the way anywhere. The Bertha part, and I call it Bertha, but I don't think they actually called them Berthas in the 1830s, but what would later turn into the Bertha part of the bodice, this ruched part of the bodice, this was not with a pattern at all. I tend to be pretty terrible about doing things like that with my Berthas. I will just drape them on the form and gather them however. So I'll do a, a gathering stitch, for example, right here, and I will usually do some sort of a gathering stitch on the sides, you know, past the arm's eye point, and then I just gather them up make them make the little pleats look pretty and then tack the heck out of it so all of this is sewn down at the base it's sewn down all the way across stitched into the arm size of course and then sewn down in the front and i've also tacked down a lot of the bertha area as it approaches the arm eye so that all of the pleats can stay very nicely in place and that really helps uh, so that this doesn't actually shift up and over the neckline so it really helps to just tack them down with just really large tacking stitches from the inside of the bodice, catching just a little bit of the, of the gathers so that it doesn't show and it lays nicely. The Bertha section has to be completed before you actually sew the shoulder seam as well. Uh, and then the shoulder seam is also piped to finish that seam nicely. But yeah, the Bertha has to go in first, then sew this then you can put the sleeves on. The sleeves are actually just gathered, very, very densely gathered so that it almost resembles cartridge pleats, but it's not cartridge pleats. It's just gathered on my machine. And in fact, I should say, I guess, most of this is machine sewn. 
I tend to sew as much as possible on the machine and only do hand sewing where I have to, which generally is finishing. So any sort of binding, the tacking like I mentioned here, hems, etc., all of that is hand sewn. Everything else really in this project is machine sewn. And I will try to point out any other places that come up that are hand sewn as we get there. So as I mentioned, these are just gathered very tightly into the arm's eye and these are pretty huge sleeves. 1830 sleeves tend to take up about a yard of fabric each. And I believe I used the pattern that I used on my last 1830s dress. So again, I'm not 100% positive where it came from, but I think it was from period costume for stage and screen because that does tend to be my go-to. It's a leg of mutton style sleeve. So it does get very narrow as it comes down past the elbow and narrows down into the cuff to the point where I can't actually point, put this on if I'm wearing this watch. I have to take the watch off before. Uh, I have gotten trapped in this before. Now, the bodice is flatlined with twill. I do tend to flatline all of my bodices with twill because I like that extra heft to it. The sleeves, on the other hand, because this is the 1830s and I wanted a little bit more body, I have flatlined these sleeves with cotton organdy, just like I did the skirts. The cuffs are a basically white, but I think it's actually just off-white, silk uh, with fusible interfacing inside, and they have just been turned back, and actually, I never even sewed down the inside of the cuff. There's literally, like, the fabric just sitting in there. It's just folded down inside. And then I did hand sew the lace to the top. This is actually just like a poly type lace that I've had in my stash for a very long time. I think I first used this on my 17th century dress in 2013. And so this is sewn down. I've hand sewn it both the top and the bottom so that it would stay nice and flat on the cuff. The velvet ribbon, however, is actually just machine sewn down because that's one of the great things about velvet ribbon. It hides all your stitches really, really nicely and easily. So that is machine sewn down. I did put the velvet ribbon on before I did any of the piping though, so that I wouldn't have to worry about finishing the ends of the ribbon. This dress closes up the back with hooks and bars and instead of having any sort of facing or anything, it's just that the silk has been made a little bit wider and has been turned under and then the hooks and bars applied on that edge so you can see a little bit there and i'll show you some more close-ups please enjoy these detail shots of both the interior and the exterior of the bodice so that you can hopefully better see how this is constructed if you have any questions about anything that you see here or anything regarding the construction of this entire outfit please leave me a comment down below That is it for the dress portion of this. Now we have to talk about accessories. Accessories is where we really leave the 1830s look because other than maybe the velvet ribbon, this is a perfectly functional 1830s look. And so with the accessories, we turn this from an 1830s look into Governor Ratcliffe. So the first accessory to go on is his medal. 
This ribbon is left over from my giant turquoise dress from several years ago. It's just an off ray brand ribbon. And I've taken tiny darts in the shoulders and in the back of the neck of the ribbon. And then the ribbon gets pinned into place, which helps to follow the shape of the neckline and has this medallion that dangles on the bottom. This medallion is from AliExpress, by the way. Next up, we also have the belt. This belt is just a piece of wide black ribbon, and I have made, again, darts in the belt to shape it so that it will fall the way that I want it to. And it is also pinned into place. The shaping here is to allow it to follow the point of the bodice, as opposed to just going straight across the waist like your average belt. And it also allows it to fall down nicely below, like Governor Ratcliffe's belt. Next, we have the Pellerine Collar. This Pellerine Collar is made out of cotton organdy, as so many of the other things in the 30s are, and it is edged with just a little narrow vintage lace. Now, this was largely hand sewn. There's just no way to get the delicacy of all of this done on machine. So I believe I attached the collar by machine, but everything else about this was hand sewn. I hand sewed all of the little narrow hemmed edges. I hand sewed all of the lace on. I hand sewed the uh, bias binding around the collar. I nicely curved that in and then it closes with a little loop, thread loop, and a little button. So I do, <laughs> whenever I make something like this that is largely hand sewn, I always just feel, I don't know, kind of like, oh it's so delicate and light. So I just kind of feel that way about this collar whereas the rest of the outfit is so like in your face but I think it also really helps to give the look of Governor Ratcliffe. I also tend to pin this in place down here so that it doesn't shift. So I will just put a straight pin that attaches it to the bodice. Obviously not a ballpoint one, but that's what I have right here on the dress form. And I will just pin this in to attach it to the bodice so that it doesn't shift from side to side. But these points here, although these aren't maybe the most historically accurate 1830s points, I think that this really helps to give the Governor Ratcliffe look while still looking very 1830s. The last accessory that I made for this is the hat. Now, largely when we think of the 1830s, we tend to think more of those giant face framing bonnets as opposed to hats. However, hats were worn as well. The most common type of hat almost resembled a bonnet like this and would give you that really, really giant brim, but would still have a crown that really sat on your head more like a bonnet as opposed to a hat. These hats were frequently seen for sporting events, like archery, for example, but would also be worn with regular clothing day wear as well. So that is what I went with with this because I just didn't see a way to translate Governor Ratcliffe's funny little hat into an 1830s bonnet. So I figured an 1830s hat was a little bit more practical for Governor Ratcliffe and still really in keeping with the period as well. And that in particular comes out in the trimming. Obviously, they didn't really use hot pink silk in the 1830s. I don't think they had invented that color yet. But the trimming, having this all off to the side like this with a really large bow, this was actually extremely common, both with the hats of the 1830s as well as the bonnets of the 1830s. So I created this ribbon myself. It's actually more of the pink shantung, and I've edged it with the burgundy velvet ribbon that's left over from my burgundy and white velvet dress. And then I've created this nice large bow, and I've wrapped the ribbon onto the outside of the brim as well to continue that almost gift wrap effect and it goes right up to the crown. I have another large bow. This is just a regular satin ribbon from Joann's but a nice large bow here and then around the crown this is actually two of the narrow velvet ribbons like on the bodice with this other sort of braided velvet ribbon here in between them filling in that gap because I a did not have any velvet ribbon this wide and b if I had used a velvet ribbon this wide because it is 
shaped. It's not straight up and down. It's a little bit conical of a crown. Uh, if I had used a wide velvet ribbon, I would actually get a lot of gaps. So having the narrower, three narrower ribbons actually really helped with the trimming. This is all glued on, but I did actually hand sew this ribbon on, which is very unusual for me. I tend to just glue everything on my hats. And then I do have a cluster of the lavender flowers to really bring back that Governor Ratcliffe look as well. Now this hat, I did create the pattern myself. Uh, I believe I used a, I, I looked at a few different hat patterns from, I think, Butterick and just made them bigger and made the crown bigger. Now, I have made hats before, so I kind of know how to do that and I'll mock things up out of paper or cardboard sometimes before I cut them out of buckram. This is made out of two layers of the heavier buckram, not what you find at Joann's. You cannot, I honestly don't know a good source for this buckram right now. It's getting harder and harder to find, but this is a nice heavy buckram and you can really see just how stiff it is. I have made this mistake in my earlier hats using stuff like Joann's buckram or even using only one layer of buckram and it just doesn't work well. What I should have done and did not do with this hat was I didn't mull it. Mulling it is when you put flannel in between the buckram and the silk and I didn't have any flannel so I did not mull this hat. So because of that you do get some of the lumps and bumps that show from the buckram which that is what the flannel would cover. But in any case, I did make this hat pattern myself, again, out of the two layers of buckram, and then it's covered both sides with the silk du silk shantung, bound with the silk shantung as well, and all of this sort of crown edging and all of the binding and everything, that's all done on by hand also. And that is the finishing touch to this outfit. I do hope that you enjoyed this video and that it was interesting and helpful for you to see how I made this. Sorry that I don't have all of the exact details like I do on most of my outfits. Again, I made this one relatively quickly. It was uh, less than a month make and I just didn't document as I went. And this was also early days of coronavirus. I started this in the very end of March and so my head and heart just weren't in a lot and I was just working to quickly do this before I lost any sewing mojo. But if you did like this video, please go ahead and click the thumbs up icon. And if you'd like to see more videos like this from me, please go ahead and click subscribe and the little bell icon to be notified every time I post a video. I do post videos over here twice a week with my sewing vlogs coming out on Tuesday, but I do post every day over on my Instagram. So please go follow me on Instagram. That's at Lady Rebecca Fashions. If you'd like to support me in all of my sewing endeavors, I have a link to my Kofi coffee, whatever it's called, below where you can send me a little bit of a thank you. Once again, I hope you enjoyed this video, and I will see you very soon in my next video. Happy sewing!